in this video I'm going to talk about mixtures, especially when it comes to water. Because we're talking about water as a characteristic of life and one of the most important things of those things is that water is a universal solvent. What does that mean really? Mixtures, anytime you think, think two things, two different types of substances and you put them in the same place and then they don't really m combine chemically together. So that means they're still isolated from each other chemically, they, they're, but they're physically in the same spot. So you can't really tell them apart. That means they're not chemically reacting, they're not changing, but they are integrated into one larger uh, substance, right? Now, there are two basic types of these mixtures. You get homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. When you look at this glass of water there, for example, it actually has sugar in there, but you can't see it because it's dissolved in it. It's homogeneous. Wherever you look, it's pretty much the same. And this could even happen on the air also. It could also happen in you know a lot of different things. But heterogeneous mixture is going to be when it doesn't really mix. Like you see the oils not really mixing and separated by density on the right side of the picture over there. So a homogeneous mixture, homo means the same. It's the same everywhere. No matter where you look, you're going to see the same thing. Now, on the other hand, a heterogeneous mixture is going to be different depending on where you look. Now, this actually actually depends on the level of analysis that you actually look at. Because when you look at blood, for example, all right, if you probably bled before in your life, when you look at that, you might think that that is what you call a homogeneous mixture because it just looks like one big red. But if you leave it by itself or if you spin it in a centrifuge, which is a machine that spins a vial really, really quick, you will see that it actually settles into layers, a layer of plasma, a layer of white blood cells and platelets, and then a layer of red blood cells. Those are the components of blood. Now, that means that blood is not really homogeneous. And in fact, if you look at the vessel when the blood is pumping and you get a random piece and you get a, some of it, you're going to see some of it, you're going to see more cells than others. And so it's not homogeneous, although it seems to be homogeneous. You, but the thing is that you need a microscope or better technology to be, realize that it's not really homogeneous. So depending on how closely you look at it, you might think it's homogeneous or heterogeneous. So the, it, again, it's now when, when it comes to actual solutions, which are typically homogeneous so, uh, mixtures, a solution is a homogeneous mixture uh, between a solvent and a solute. And we'll talk more about that in a sec. And here you see several examples of these solutions and notice that they can be gaseous, they can be liquid, or they can even be solid, as it is in an alloy, for example. But all they all have in common is that no matter where you look, the distribution of the parts is going to be identical, meaning it's going to be homogeneous. Now, in a solution, you have two parts. You have the solvent and you have the solute. The solvent is what you put the solute into. All right. So, for example, water is the solvent in a water-sugar mixture. And the, and the sugar is going to be the solute or the thing that's dissolving. All right. The thing that does the dissolving is going to be the solvent. All right. Um, now, an important concept when you're talking about solutions is the idea of concentration. Now, there's a lot of different ways to measure concentration. You can measure by how many grams you have per liter. You can also have measure it in moles, which is the amount of molecules in a certain volume. Uh, but whichever way you do it, and I'm not going to get into the chemistry of this. You're going to learn more about that when you take a chemistry class. What a concentration is going to be important for biology. Now, a solution can be either dilute, which is when it means it doesn't have a lot of stuff. You see that on the top left side. Or it can be very concentrated when there's a lot of stuff in it. There are three levels of, there are three levels of concentration. You have unsaturated, you have saturated, and you have supersaturated. Now, an unsaturated solution is a solution that has less solute in it than it can fit in it. That means you can still put more stuff there. A saturated solution can't have more in it than, you, than it's already in it. If you put anything else, it's going to actually not dissolve. You're not going to be able to dissolve it no matter how hard you try. And it has something to do with how much solvent you have because, you know, eventually it, you run out of solvent to do the dissolving. And we're going to learn about how, how things actually dissolve in a second and you understand a little bit more about that. But you can also create what is called a supersaturated solution. And that happens if you, say, heat up the solution, which actually expands the space between the molecules. That lets you fit a little bit more. And then when you let it cool, it looks like it's dissolved even though it's got more in it then it should, but the moment you drop a single drop of something else in that solution, the whole thing will come out of solution. And that's what's really cool about supersaturated solutions, and we'll do a lab in class that's going to show that, all right, a demonstration for that. These are the li different levels of concentration for a solution that I want you to know about. Now, when you're trying to create a solution, uh, you, what matters is going to be the solubility. Now, the, unlike concentration, which is how much is in the solution, a solubility has to do with how much can fit in the solution. 
And that depends on a lot of things. It depends on how hot the, solu the solution is because if it's hotter, again, the molecules expand and then more things can fit in between. It also depends on the type of solute. If the solute is very chunky, very large, not very soluble, you know, you're going to have trouble dissolving it. Now, if the sol it also depends on the type of solvent and how good the solvent is at dissolving things. How quickly it dissolves also matters. But how quickly it dissolves also depends on a lot of things. If you try to put very tiny little things in a solution, it's going to dissolve faster than if you put large, chunky stuff. All right? Because it increases the surface area for the solvent to do its job. If you also increase the temperature, the molecules will start moving faster, meaning it will dissolve faster. And also, if you stir, for the same reason, it will dissolve faster. So if you're trying to make something dissolve faster, you've got to crunch it, you've got to heat it, and you've got to stir it. All right? And of course, to dissolve more, you have to lose the right amount, the right type of solvent, and you also have to make it hotter as well. All right? Now, there's a few rules when it comes to solutions, okay? Uh, polar molecules, which are molecules that have, you know, we talked about this before, molecules that have an area of the molecule that has a more charge than another, or which happens anytime you have two atoms which are either sharing or transfer electrons because one atom is more electronegative than the other. Whenever you have such a polar molecule, a molecule there's charge or a molecule that there's regions which are more charged than others, like the water molecule, these molecules will tend to dissolve in uh, water or with each other. So if you get a polar thing, it will dissolve in a polar thing. And I like the rule that like dissolves like, you know? It's kind of like uh, water is kind of like, you know, you know, it's discriminative. You know, if you're not like me, I'm not going to deal with you. You know, you're going away from me. Uh, you know, so if you're, if you're polar, you dissolve in polar things. Now, if you're nonpolar, you will not dissolve in polar things. And that's why oil does not dissolve in water. You put oil in water, oil does not dissolve because oil is nonpolar. So any molecule that doesn't have charges or doesn't have an unequal distribution of charges, is going to fail to dissolve in things which have charges, but they will dissolve in each other. So things which are nonpolar can dissolve on each other. So that's why you put something that oil and olive oil, you, you can mix them two together, you know, because they're both, you know, um, nonpolar. Now there's another way to refer to these key terms. All right, if you if you like if you're like water and you're polar and you dissolve in water, you're called hydrophilic. What that means is that you are soluble. You will like water and you dissolve in it. All right? Now, if you are going to be unlike water and you're nonpolar, then you don't dissolve in water. You're insoluble and you're what's called hydrophobic. You avoid water and you separate from it instead. All right? And remember, the rule is like dissolves like. And if you're not like it, you won't dissolve in each other. And that's going to be very important when we talk about things. Now, how do I actually work? How does this actually work? How do things dissolve? Now, it depends on what you're talking about. Now, if it's a salt, which is something that actually has bonded by ionic bonds, and you throw that in water, the way water is going to do that is that all the positive uh, ions, like all the positive ions are going to be surrounded by the water molecule, by the oxygen end. So you see this happening over here, all right? A positive ion, which is an atom that has a positive charge, it will attract the negative end of the water molecule, which is the oxygen end. But a negative ion, all right, which has a negative charge, it has more electrons than, than protons, will, absorb, will attract the positive end of the water molecule, which is the hydrogen end. Regardless, what water is going to end up doing is they're going to break apart that ionic compound and surround it because water is acting like a magnet. And this has something to do with the adhesive properties of water. So when you throw ions in water, ionic compounds, they will dissociate. And that's the one first way to make a solution by dissociation. The other way to make a solution is by surrounding the molecule uh, without dissociating. And, and this was you see this in compounds that have polar regions. Now you see all these groups over here that have oxygen. Remember, oxygen is very electronegative. So this means it's they're gonna start sucking up electrons. These areas are gonna be attracting electrons. So there's gonna be this molecule here, which is a sugar is not going to dissociate, it's not going to break apart the way that salt, which is ionic, does when you throw it in water, which is why we say covalent bonds are actually stronger than ionic bonds because co ionic bonds break apart in solutions, but covalent bonds do not. But even if you don't break them, these molecules will have these you know, polar areas.
and in the water molecules will be attracted by hydrogen bonds to these polar areas and then are going to dissolve in the same way it was dissolving the salt. And this will even happen to proteins. Areas of the protein will be polar and that means the water will again form interactions with the areas of the protein which are polar and dissolve it, surround it. So solutions are going to be things where water is going to either break apart, which if, if it's ionic, or surround, if it's covalent, areas which are polar or charged, and that way make them disappear inside the solution, all right? So that's kind of how dissolving actually works. Now, there are basically two types of solutions which matter for uh, biology. The first type is called an aqueous solution. And an aqueous solution is kind of like honey or blood or, you know, a sugar in water. It's based on water. Water is the solvent. But you also have, you know, tinctures. Now, tinctures, you know, if you heard a word in Spanish, tinta, it means paint, you know, like or the uh, ink. And that's basically a solution that's based on alcohol instead of being based on water. And in some biological applications, that's going to be important. Like beer or liquor or, or ink is an example of a tincture, all right? There's also another type of key term that you have to know. Uh, solutions that have ionic compounds inside of them which dissociate and form those positive and negatively charged things, which we just talked about, will have charged ions flowing around the water. That will allow the solution to conduct electricity. Such a solution is called an electrolyte solution. Now, a solution that does not have ionic compounds on it and does not have things dissolved in it that have charges are, are going to be called non-electrolyte solutions. There's also another classification, the solutions that matters, which is hard water versus soft, soft water. Any water that has any solution that has metals dissolved in it, like, for example, sodium is a metal, is considered hard water. Any solution without metals in it is considered soft water. All right, so that's a simple one to understand. That could show up, so I got to know about that. A few more things that I want to talk about before the video is over. When you put stuff in water, you're going to affect the way the water is going to evaporate or boil. In a solution will boil or freeze at a different point as a simple solvent would. So when you put stuff in water, you're going to affect the water's melting point or freezing point or the boiling point of water. It has to do with the fact that when you have crystals in the water, all right, in order for water to freeze, it needs to form crystals. But because you have those uh, salts or whatever else in the solution, it's going to interfere with the formation of those crystals, which makes it harder for water to freeze, which is why the, the, the freezing point goes down when you have things in water, which is why up north they spray salt in the road to try to get rid of the ice. Because when you spray salt in the road, it make, uh, you're going to lower the, boil, the freezing point. That means it needs to be colder for things to be ice, right? So that's one thing. And then the opposite is also true. To boil, when you have those salt particles in there, the, it makes it harder because there's attraction between the salt and the water for things to evaporate, which me, this means it's gonna, it needs to be hotter for the water to evaporate when there's salts in it. That's called boiling point elevation, all right? So putting things in solution actually raises the boiling point and lowers the freezing point. And there's a lot of applications for that, including the thing about spraying salts in the roads. The last thing I want to talk about is the idea of fizz or effervescence. Sometimes when you do things in solution, there's gases that precipitate from the solution, and then you get these fizzes. That's what a fizz is. And this is going to be important when you do labs in the class too. So when you talk about fizz, remember, it's gases which are coming out of a solution. And also, don't assume that things that look like solutions are always solutions. There are other things which are not really solutions, like suspensions, colloids, and emotions. Emotions are things which are not even supposed to mix, that you do something special to it and you force it to mix. Like oil, there's some things you can do which involve heating and cooling and heating and cooling again, which can actually force the oil to dissolve in the water. So that's actually interesting. That's called an emotion. Like, and then you have suspensions and colloids, which are look like solutions, but they're not really solutions. Instead, there's nothing actually dissolving. There's nothing surrounding the molecules that, like that actually happens when you're dissolving things. The molecules are just in there, but they're not actually dissolved. They're not being dissociated or surrounded. They're just in the middle of the liquid. And when that's the case, it typically is not really homogeneous. And if you let it sit for a while, it will separate into layers. That happens to milk, it happens to blood, it happens to ketchup. So these are examples of not really, uh, those are colloids, because they do separate after a while, because the things are not really dissolved. They're just suspended. They're there in the liquid, 
but they're not really surrounded by the water molecules the way it really is in a solution. All right, so you learned everything you could about mixtures. I hope you learned a lot. I'll see you in the next video.